Hello and welcome. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. I'm Dr. Heather Cruz. I'm the pastor of the Courthouse Road Church. Today we're going to experience communion at home. We are going to recommit our lives to Christ through an active lesson. We're going to pick up emblems and partake of them as we remember our Savior and what his death means to us. As we go forward, you may want to grab a few things. The first thing, you want a basin big enough to wash your feet in and a towel to dry your feet off afterwards. We're going to follow Christ's example of where he washed his disciples' feet. That's what this is for. Also, you're gonna to wanna to look around in the house, find some grape juice and unleavened bread. Think crackers. This is a reminder of what it was like to flee from Egypt without even enough time to let the bread rise. And this will remind us of the blood that was spilled for us and the body that was broken. So if you don't have them yet, you'll want to grab those in preparation for what we're going to do today. This is all about remembering Christ. It's about remembering what he did for us and being thankful that we have a savior who recognized our need and then stepped in and made a difference. Welcome to Communion at Home. Hello everybody once again. It's now the time where we worship God through giving. Your tithes and your offerings enable the church community to continue with the work of evangelism and spreading the word of God, both in our local community and around the world. So we welcome you all to give, and I'm going to show a short video of how you can give online. Thank you. You go to any browser, I'm going to use Google Chrome, and you type in Courthouse Road, Seventh Day Adventist Church. And you can come to our website right over there. And then if you go to worship services, you can go down to bulletin and then just scroll down and you'll get to this section and here it shows different ways in which you can give the easiest way is through texting where you can text any dollar amount to 84321 to give the other way is through our website where we currently are right now so if you click on this image It will take you to the Courthouse Road Seventh-day Adventist Church online giving. And here you can enter the amount you want. Let's say $100. You don't have to select. You can also put a zero if you need to. Uh, and different ways of giving down there. So if you scroll down, you hit continue. And you can either log in, register for a new account, or you can just um, type as a guest. So you fill in the information with your details, your first name, your last name, your email, phone, country, your address, city, and state, and then you will hit submit. The other way to give is to go through our church website, go to connect, and you scroll down, we have an option to give down there, and it will take you to this page, and with the same place, it takes you here and shows you how to give. We also have alternative ways of giving, and this is through the Planning Center online web portal for the people who have access to that. They can do that as well. Even though it's a little different right now, giving is still an essential part of washing.
can you pray with me as we continue our time together? Heavenly Father, we recognize you are here, that you love us, that you have carried us through so much. And now as we begin this new year, we turn our eyes fully toward our Savior. We invite you in. We open our hearts up and say every corner we want you to live in, every peace that is not surrendered, we desire you to touch and to redeem. Today, as we remember your death, we pray that your face will be seen. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Humans communicate in a lot of different ways. They communicate with words. They communicate with motions. You see, you could choose a word from any of the thousands of languages that exist on this globe, and in a way, the tone you say it, the manner in which you, which you say it, could mean more, even more than the words themselves. Take, for example, I love you. I could say, I love you. Or you could throw some sarcasm in there and say, I love you. Often, there is more to communication than just the words that we choose to say, the tone. We can scream our words. We can add sarcasm. We can say them sweetly or in a sacred manner. Even more effective than words is our body language. We can tense up or we can grit our teeth. We can pat someone on the back, give them a thumbs up, or communicate our displeasure, or give someone a swift kick in the pants. Art, whether classical, impressionistic, or simply a cartoon, carries a nonverbal message. These are all ways we communicate beyond the words that we speak. So, have you ever considered food as a love language? Some of your stomachs just growled and you said, yes, that's my love language, bring it on. But think about speaking with food. What you serve to someone communicates a great deal. Think about those banquets that you went on. I remember one where we went to Taco Bell. Somehow that 59 cent value menu burrito had a little bit of different meaning than when we went to the fancy hotel and were served on fine china, even though the ingredients may have just been placed in a different way. It makes a difference where we choose to go. This is why Valentine's Day often finds all the fancy restaurants booked up months in advance preparing. What about inviting a group of people over to your home? Would it make a difference if you pulled out a box of, of week old pizza or you ordered something new? What about inviting a group of people over and serving them week-old leftovers instead of ordering fresh piping hot pizza, making a salad and having a nice pitcher of ice water? Taking guests to eat out at last became widely accepted. The choice of restaurants also speaks volumes wherever it may be, writes Rhea Tannehill in Food in History. She goes on to say that while cultures may change, the basic language of food does not. To offer too cheap or commonplace a meal is insulting. The opposite? Ostentatious. What we serve our guests makes a difference. You see, Jesus was a master communicator, and he used food to teach one of the deepest and most meaningful lessons of his earthly career. The purpose of this meal was to commemorate a historical event and point toward forward toward a new one. On the eve of his trial and execution, Jesus gathered his followers to celebrate a Jewish feast called Passover. The Passover commemorated a flight of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. You can check it out in Exodus 12. This meal makes use of two key elements, bread and juice. Jesus blessed both and then changed the traditional meaning by infusing some new ones into it. Let me read to you a scripture. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Matthew 26, 26. He was infusing a whole new meaning into simple bread. Next, he said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of our sins. A simple cup of juice now had new meaning. It pointed toward, toward hope. It showed a Savior, a Savior who loved. At first blush, this imagery of, of it smacks of cannibalism, and many non-Christians have interpreted it that way. In fact, some early Christian believers were accused of devouring human beings for this very reason. This, of course, was not true, for God would never condone such an act. It has an entirely different purpose. 
for the symbolism of the bread and the juice in the Lord's Supper. It is pointing as a reminder, a visible, tangible, touchable reminder of our Savior. So to understand the Lord's Supper, communion, what we're partaking of today, it's helpful to keep in mind the Passover from which it is derived. You'll recall that God delivered the Israelites from Egypt with 10 plagues. The final plague, the one that ushered in an era of freedom for the Israelites, involved death. And the way to be saved from that death was placing the lamb's blood on the doorpost as a reminder that those inside had accepted Christ in their place. Every firstborn in Egypt would die except those who had accepted him and invited him to pass over. You can check it out in Exodus chapter 11. The only way the Israelites could avoid this horrible thing was for happening to their own children was to kill a lamb, which took its place, and spread its blood over the doorframe. And this is what God said in Exodus 12 verse 13. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. The Passover was passing by without doing harm. The sacrifice of the lamb brought salvation and foreshadowed a savior who would come, who would bring salvation in a new way. Deliverance from slavery and hope that would come when Christ died, when he came and was that Passover lamb many, many years in the future when Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus appeared on earth, John the Baptist declared him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1 verse 29. Additionally, Jesus likened our failure to do what is right and our tendency to be selfish, what we call sin, to slavery, when he said, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin, John 8 34. So Jesus, through the shedding of his blood on the wooden cross, hearkened back to the door frames of the ancient Israelites. He illustrated in tangible ways in his act the deliverance that we would receive from the power and consequences of our failures and our own selfishness. Jesus' death removes us from the path of God's wrath and ushers us into a new life of freedom, of hope. It's what Jesus' death on a cross, it is the ultimate realization of what the Old Testament lamb represented. It's what they looked forward to as they painted and remembered that the angel would pass over them. They look forward to the Lamb of God. The Lord's Supper, communion, represents this through the symbols of the broken bread and the broken, spilt grape juice. Christians call this meal the Lord's Supper. Today we call it communion, connection with Christ. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the emblems communicate to us what our God has done for us through the language of tradition, ritual, and food. And there's more. Before you eat, and before I eat a meal, we wash our hands. It depends on how much of a mess we make. We may even clean them up after we finish. We wash our hands or clean them with a napkin. There's an element to remember during the Lord's Supper that also involves cleaning. During the meal, Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him, John 13, verse 5. The disciples' feet had real gunk, dirt, caked on them. After all, they wore sandals and walked around on in the hot desert and on the dirt road. Proper etiquette required that the host send a servant to wash the feet of his guests. It's part of what you did for hospitality. For anyone else to wash the guests' dirty feet would require a special kind of humility and love, which, of course, Jesus possessed. Peter became so appalled at seeing his master bending down, stooping to perform this servant's job that he asked to be excused. But Jesus reminded him that if he did not have his feet washed, then he couldn't be a part of what God wanted to do in his life. There in verses 6 through 10 of John 13. After Jesus finished this act of service, he said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. The idea contained in the act of the foot washing which may still, many still practice, and we do, as Jesus explicitly told us to, is not simply to come to him to receive deliverance, but to turn around and serve others just as he did to us. We can be delivered from selfishness, and we're very prone to it, to put ourselves first, to choose the biggest slice of pie, to grab the glass that has the most juice in it. 
But Jesus wants to displace that selfishness with an act of kindness. We come to our master's table to receive a feast of love, where God communicates his plan for us through food, and then challenges us to turn and sacrifice for others. Ultimately, what God really wants us to learn from the Lord's Supper and foot washing is to bring the lessons of these rituals to our everyday lives so that we can live what it is to understand our need for a Savior, to choose to follow Him, and as that love is heaped upon us, to share it with others. The first way we are going to share that love today is if you will grab that basin and that towel and take a few moments to wash one another's feet, pray together, serve one another. It is a servant's work to kneel down, to wash someone's feet, to see the flakes of dirt fall off, and then to dry them. But today we serve just as Christ set the example that we should serve. While you're doing that, you're going to hear some music. It's these hymns of praise to God that point to him. This music will be your backdrop to washing and serving another through washing their feet. And then we'll come back and I'll lead you through the partaking of the emblems.
pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide straight for today and bright hope Take the world, 
but give me Jesus. In his cross my trust shall be, till with clear, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord I see. serving one another, for following Christ's example, being willing to serve another in this way. The next step in following Christ's example is to partake of the emblems themselves. They're simple. You might find them packed in a school lunch. You might see the, them just as you go about your day. But today they mean something special. Today they point us to our Savior. Today they are all about recommitting our lives to Christ. It begins with unleavened bread and fresh grape juice. We choose these unleavened bread because it harkens back to Egypt when they left without time for it to rise, but also there's no leaven in this because our Christ, our Savior's body was perfect and clean. He depended upon his Heavenly Father. I'm going to try that. It's okay if, if you want to just clip it off later. We have served one another. We've knelt down just as Christ did. After he had washed his disciples' feet, they moved on to the emblems. They're what you have in your home, and you might find that unleavened bread in your home anyway. You may, on a regular basis, put it in a little baggie and send it with your child to school. They have your fresh grape juice, and it may be a favorite snack that your children ask for. Today, these emblems remind us of our Savior. They aren't just any snack. They are arrows that point us toward our Heavenly Father, toward our Savior's, toward our Savior's death. So today we take this bread and we take this juice, and we remember our Savior. And in this moment, we're going to dedicate them in prayer that they would remind us of Him. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we have these emblems and we recognize that they are holy only because you are here. They are holy because you use them to teach us a lesson. So we ask that you will bless this juice, you will bless, bless this bread, that it will remind us of our Savior. That as we partake of them, there will be holy awe in our hearts that comes forth, bursting into joy and thanksgiving for our Savior who did this. May you use these to remind us of what he did and allow us to recommit our lives to him. And I pray this in our Savior's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're following an example. It's in 1 Corinthians 11. It says this, For I received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As you pick up that bread and you partake of it, remember him. The 
passage goes on. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Partake of this and remember your Savior. It's an object lesson that is living and alive. It's an object lesson that is alive in our lives and in our hearts. It's the pulse of hope that flows through our hearts as we face uncertain times. It's the pulse of hope that comes as we look at what 2021 will hold. And we say in this moment, the thing that we will do is we will begin with Christ. Today, as we partook of this communion at home, we testified that Christ is important in our lives. We recognize his sacrifice, and in it, we recognize our need of it. As we take of these things, it is like saying, Heavenly Father, I accept what you've done. I accept Christ's play, death in my place. So this is where we begin. This is where we begin 2021, with our faith firmly planted on Christ, so that what comes next will be faced in hope of our Savior, and the hope of eternal life that we have because of him. Please pray with me as we close. Heavenly Father, you've heard our hearts speaking to you in this sacred moment, in this sacred practice that we partake of. We see again what it means to have a Savior in our lives and to know the hope that comes that says we can be forgiven. Another has paid the price for our sins, and that there is hope ahead. So may you be the God who shines a light into this coming year. May you be the one who is a light to our path, who leads us step by step. And may you be the Savior who carries us through, through this year, firmly leaning on you. We pray this in Jesus' name, in thankfulness for our Savior. Amen.